Hello, people. Today's class is about what is history? The other important part of social studies. This is the part one. And in this part one, we're going to study about how we look at history. As we know, history is the story of the past, but it has to be studied in many different aspects. That is why there are certain things that we must understand about history through time. And also we have to know about the people that are in charge of making us understand about history, okay? But first, we're going to take a look at the key terms of this class. Here they are. The first one is sustenance, that which sustains life, food or nourishment. Prehistory, the story before recorded history, as learned from archeology span and other areas of study. Supply, the amount of goods available for purchase at a given price. Demand, the amount of goods people are ready and able to buy at a certain price. And absolute power, the power of a ruler that is not limited by a constitution, parliament, or other similar form of government, as in monarchy or dictatorship. How are people alike and different? In history, we find out about that in a very clear way. They are different in their collection of memories, in their physical features, of course, in their beliefs, in their ideas and their dreams. I mean, uh, studying this, you can see how the inner aspects of a human being turn to be more important than the physical aspects because they are what make a difference in the way history is developed, because it's what people do or think. And alike, because all people need food, all people need shelter and clothing. They must learn to adapt to their physical environment, as we studied in geography, remember? And they must find sustenance from the earth. They have to take advantage of the resources existent on the earth in order to survive. Look at this. They collect memories, they have different ideas and dreams, they need food and shelter and clothing. Social history. People need families and friends, ways to get along with other people and raise families in order to preserve their legacy. People want to be connected with a set of religious beliefs or a spiritual connection. That is why Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, and many other religious currents exist. People need to be creative to writing, painting, music, etc. as a form of expression because sometimes just talking is not enough for certain people. So they express what they feel and what they think through art in its many different ways. To meet their needs and wants, people build houses, wear different clothes, create different families and create different works of art. Uh, but what does it say here? The key for all of this is that all these topics coexist in the same society. We must understand that not everyone thinks the same way and not everyone is going to live the same way. So we have to respect that. Or history. Early people pass family stories and beliefs from one generation to another. And that is the bottom line of our history. Before writing was created in the times of Mesopotamia, 
the elders started passing their stories and their experiences to the younger ones. And that is how history was passed from generation to generation and was able to be preserved. Our history gives evidence that history began before the invention of writing. As I said before, there was no writing in early times, in the age of stone, for example. So it was necessary for people to have a way of transmitting those experiences to the people that was the next generation to come. And prehistory has evident artifacts. Since writing wasn't invented, the things that they could make with their own hands were the only proof that they existed and they wanted to leave their mark in history as well. So there, those artifacts were left behind as a symbol of what they wear in the story of the world. These are people passing stories to the younger ones, painting on stones, like in the caves in Lascaux and Altamilla, you see? Economic history, that is another aspect of history. That began with trade. When there wasn't money or things like that, or banks or things like that, the trade began. And it began because it made sense for those with an abundance of goods to trade for the things they lacked. If I had a lot of corn, but another person had wheat, I traded corn with wheat. I give that person my corn and that person gave me my wheat. So it was a win-win situation. And the law of supply and demand started to arise. When there is high supply, there is low demand. I mean, there's more product than people who need the product. And when there is low supply, there is a high demand. When the supply starts to diminish, the people start to go oh, crazy in search for it, you know? because there is a few of it. And then the, and that depends on many uh, factors, okay? Governments establish laws for trading. Even trading has its own rules. And those rules are established by the government nowadays. Now people use money. The money was created in China. So, from that invention, it was possible to countries to have their own particular currency. In general, every nation has its own economic systems, but some economic systems are similar between some countries. For example, some countries have the same currency as United States and Puerto Rico and Canada. They have different value and they have a different way of uh, um, making their businesses. But at the end, it's the same currency. This is what trade represents as one example. We on one hand have a lot of petroleum, but other countries have food that we can grow here. So we trade petroleum for other things like these products. And this is how the law of supply and demand happens. And this is the money as we know it, you know, in euros and dollars, which are the main currencies in the world. Political history. That is a major aspect of history because that sets the basis for a society to be developed in every place. Early civilizations were often governed by a council of elders. In ancient times, the oldest people of the city or of the town were the ones who set the rules for the whole society because they were considered the wisest, the most reliable, and the most intelligent 
and the most experienced. So the youngest people had the need to rely on those people to set the rules for the society to be developed. As civilization became more complex, some cultures chose one supreme ruler. When the fight for power started, it was necessary for some societies in the world to turn to the decision of choosing one ruler. As it happened in England, for example, this is the Queen Elizabeth I. She ruled the country for 40 years. And in places like China, there was a monarchy that lasted mil thousands of years and ended in the 20th century, which, were, which was called dynasty. Uh, what does the dynasty mean? That the parent passes the power to the son. But if that dynasty didn't work in the country, another dynasty take the control of the country. So it was sort of a fight for the power there, you know? And by the end of this 20th century, most nations allowed people to choose their leaders. And that is what is known as democracy, which has its origin in ancient Greece. I mean, the Greeks started to talk about democracy, but democracy started to become a reality in the 20th century. And in time, more and more nations tried to establish a democratic system because it allowed people to choose their rulers if they didn't work as rulers. And tried to choose their representatives in every aspect of the government, in the Congress, in the Supreme Court. And they started to notice that it was more effective because a change from time to time was necessary. Military history. It says, the reasons for people to fight each other could be economic, political, religious, territorial, or simply for greater glory. Conflicts have existed since the beginning of times, and those are the reasons. Many disagreements arise as long as populations grew. The more the people, the more the disagreements, because every person has a different point of view and their own criteria about things. So it was pretty hard at that time, as long as the population grew, to try to make an agreement among everyone. As empires grew, responsibilities and possibilities of disagreement grew as well. The empires, each one of them wanted to take over power. So when a place didn't want to be subdued to that power, they simply went against that empire. So the disagreements began to grow. They had the chance to build large armies because they tried to convince other people in the country to defend their territory and their independence as a nation. So some people joined those armies for simple conviction. Increasing economic success allowed them to pay for arms and ammunition. As long as a country became more and more rich and have a better economy, they were able to acquire more arms and more ammunition and more technology. And weapons have also changed through history. At the beginning of times, weapons were very rudimentary, but with the increase of technology, that has changed a lot. In fact, some of the most lethal weapons nowadays are biological, and that was developed at the beginning of the 20th century, as you can see here. Okay.
cultural expression. All through history, people have expressed themselves in art, music, literature, and crafts. Through all history, we have seen how this different aspects of the art or forms of art have evolutioned. At the beginning, it was pretty simple. There were only cuneiform writing and paintings on stones and percussion instruments and artifacts. Over time, those forms of expression have changed a lot, but they have the same purpose, to let people express themselves and make a mark in their own story so it can be passed from one generation to another because every piece of art describes one part of history. Artistic expression has sometimes been inspired by a love of God or a supreme being. The first forms of expression were inspired by the things people believed in, the sun, the moon, the weather, the, the things they could perceive with their senses. Later on, they started to think in things that they could not see, like in forms of energy, and that, and how, and that's how the presence of God started to turn powerful. They could not see it or see him or her, they don't know what it is, but they are aware that it exists because that can be the only explanation for things that we can look at first sight. You know, look, those are different forms of expression. This is music, painting, and this is inspired in the life of Jesus. You see, this is the Mona Lisa. This is the most famous piece of art ever created, you know, and these are artifacts. But artifacts have changed as well in time. These are the people who study the past. People have different roles in the development of history, but these people in particular have a key part in the understanding of history because they specialize in it, you know? These are the key terms for the people. Archaeologist. Archaeologist is a person who studies the life and culture of the past, especially ancient peoples. They start to dig in the ground and in books and documents and artifacts in order to see how people lived many, many centuries ago. Anthropologist. Anthropologist is a person who studies humans, human behavior especially the physical and cultural characteristics, customs, and social relationships. To understand how people get along nowadays, it is important to understand what happened before, and anthropologists are in charge of that. Paleontologist, a person who studies the life forms of the past, especially prehistoric life forms as dinosaurs, using animal and plant fossils. As humans, plants and animals have evolved, and it is important to understand how those living things behave nowadays. It is important to know how they were many centuries ago as well. I mean, millions of years ago. Geologist, a person who studies the Earth's crust, which is the surface of the Earth, and the way in which its layers were formed. The formation of Earth is always a topic of interest. Why? Because, as you know, once the Earth was a single piece of land, and there were many factors that led to the separation of this piece of land in many pieces. 
and this separation led to other changes in history. So the geologist is in charge of that, to study these changes in the surface of the earth so we can understand what happened to know how the different groups of people were developed in the different places as a consequence of that separation. And at last, we have the historian, which is an expert in or student of history, especially that of a particular period, geographical region, or social phenomenon. Not all historians are specialized in all stages of history. Some people specialize only in prehistory, for instance, and some other people study medieval times. And some people are in charge of study everything about the wars through history in the world. So that is why their roles are so important in the understanding of history. The archaeologists rely on fragments of tools, seeds, coins, bones, household utensils, and building materials. They depend mostly on things they can find underground or behind walls by demolishing structures in order to see what was going on at that time, you know? Look at this. They are digging in some places in search of things that give them evidence of what happened at that time. They date the artifacts using carbon dating. That is a method in order to know the age of an artifact. Because the carbon is organic matter, decreases over time. The age of something is determined by the amount of carbon that remains in it. If an artifact has less carbon, it's more ancient. If the artifact has more carbon, it's more recent. You see? That is why this carbon dating is important to study in order to determine the age of certain artifacts. Anthropologists. They are interested mostly in the customs and relationship among people. They study the tribes and the current society, the urban society, the rural society, how they behave, how they interact with each other, how was many centuries ago, how was millions of years ago. And they have encouraged archaeologists to look for clues to the behaviors of ancient people. Through artifacts, archaeologists can figure out the behaviors of certain people at certain times. And anthropologists are a support system in that search. Paleontologists. They help us understand what life was like in prehistoric times by studying fossils or hardened remains of plant animals and humans. Being a paleontologist is hard because it takes years and years of research to find out the origin of some living things just by studying these fossils, not only from animals, but also for plants and ancient human lives, you know? Not only plants and animals, but also humans. Fossils can show how large the earliest humans were, what they ate, what tools they used, and how they lived. Remember that Thousands of years ago, the humans, as we know today, were not the same, didn't exist, you know? They were different. So they are in charge of studying the aspects of all those humans that existed many years ago. As you can see in here, you see? This is the fossil of a fish, of a prehistoric fish. This is a bone. Imagine this size. This has to be a large dinosaur. And these are different human skeletons according to different stages of human life. 
geologists. They examine the size, shape, and age of land formations. They can determine the age of a mountain, for example. Oh, this mountain was raised or raised in the year 145 before Christ. Imagine that. Imagine to have that knowledge. Amazing, huh? They gather information about how layers of soil and rock have changed because of many factors, weather, erosion, you know? They can describe the climate of previous eras, how they were before. By studying the rocks, they can see how was the weather at that moment in a certain region. Maybe now it's warm, but what if it was cold 300, 400 years ago? They are in charge of figuring that out. They can detail natural disasters that may have struck early people such as floods, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. As you know, those natural disasters make a difference in the physical features of a certain region. And the geologists are in charge of studying those phenomena to understand how a landform of a certain region is formed in the current times. Look at this. They are studying rocks, glaciers, volcanoes. You see? It's pretty interesting. Historians. Historians are not that adventurous, but they play an important role in collecting the information and make it organized for people to understand. Look at this. Their main task is to search for the story of human history. They constantly use what they know now to help people understand people and events of the past. Why? Because if there were events that represented uh, damage for some groups of people, it is important not to make the same mistakes. That is why it's important to collect that information. They often collect information from other sciences. So they rely on the studies of archaeologists, paleontologists, geologists, and anthropologists in order to support their own discoveries. They organize, and this is the key, vast amounts of information about the past in ways that we can understand. Some aspects in history are pretty hard to understand. So they commit to the purpose of making us understand in a better way what happened, how it happened, where and when it happened, and why it happened. And if it was bad, what can we do for that not to happen again? Look. You see, it takes years and years for historians to collect all that information and organizing it so we can grab it and understand it in a more efficient way. And that's it, people. As you can see, every person that studies history is important. It's important for us to know that people play a key role in the development of history in the world. That is why our actions every day are important and matter. And it is important for each one of us to make our best in order to leave a good mark in our own history and the history of our environment to make this world a better place. So that's all. I hope you enjoyed the class. I'll see you next time. Bye.